Let's go ahead and um, look in our scriptures today to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 1. Um, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4 today. We're going to begin a study through the book of Luke. Uh, I've decided to go ahead and pick this time of the year to start it because, um, you know, it, it begins with a lot of the Christmas story narrative. And so we can get that as we begin, you know, as we're into this season and then um, into next year, we'll continue on through um, the gospel of Luke, learning more about the life of Jesus and the lessons that we can learn um, from that. Uh, so today, looking at Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, as, as he begins uh, this gospel, he says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. So as we, as we begin this study in the Gospel of Luke, you'll notice that he has quite an introduction um, to this gospel. Um, he talks about being uh, to, to, to those who were eyewitnesses of Jesus. He says that others have written about his life. We know that Luke was not an eyewitness of Jesus, but he did some research. Um, he says here that he investigated everything carefully um, from the beginning. As we study through the book of Luke and look through the life of Jesus, we'll look at things like the miracles of Jesus. We'll see his interaction with the disciples. We'll observe the confrontations that he had with religious leaders and also the opportunities he had to share with those who were willing to believe and follow him. And through all of this, hopefully we're going to find some lessons for our life of what it means um, to follow Christ as we see Christ and those who followed him. When you look at the different Gospels, you know, we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Um, we, as you study each one of those Gospels, you'll notice that each one has a very specific emphasis. Matthew shows us Jesus fulfilling um, the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. Mark shows Jesus as a man of action, and we see him doing this and immediately doing something else. John shows us the divinity of Jesus since he was from the beginning and created all things. We get that perspective uh, from the Gospel of John. Luke, as we will see, is written to a Gentile audience, uh, focusing on the fact that Jesus came to be the savior of the whole world and not just for the Jews. Uh, as we are in the Christmas season, we recognize that Matthew and Luke are the gospels where we receive um, the, Chris, the Christmas narrative, the birth of Christ narrative. We find in Matthew a focus on Joseph and also with the Magi we find in um, Luke we have the, the focus more on Mary and her perspective of things. Um, I, I find it very interesting that when we look at the book of Luke, um, we are introduced to several people. These are people that you may not know much about, um, and that's why I've titled this sermon, Who Are These People? So let's meet some of them um, this morning. First of all, we have Luke. Um, he wrote this gospel, and so let's start with him. Um, not only did, write, did Luke write the Gospel of Luke, but he also wrote the book of Acts. Um, think of Luke and Acts as a two-volume set um, that's been put together. And in a little bit, I'll read from some scriptures in the book of Acts that show what I'm saying about all of that. Um, we know that Luke did not travel with Jesus. He was not a follower of Jesus while he was on this earth. Um, he came later. He came to Christ later. In fact, much later. Uh, Luke was probably a convert of Paul. Um, and we do know that he assisted Paul um, in, in Paul's ministry. So why do we call him Dr. Luke? Or why do we call him a doctor? Well, there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, Luke uses some medical term, terminology um, in his writing in, in, of that day, things that a doctor would say about situations. You know, it seems like when we read some of the healings, those are some of the phrases and the terminology that Luke uses that's different than the other Gospels. Plus, it's pretty easy to consider him a doctor when we look at what Paul says about Luke in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Colossians 4.14, Luke, 
the beloved physician sends you his greetings, and also Demas. And so Paul called Luke a physician, a doctor, and that's why we, whenever we talk about Luke, usually it's brought up that he was a doctor. Um, we also know uh, from Scripture that Luke traveled with Paul. Remember, he didn't travel with Jesus, but he was with Paul, and we find very clearly that he traveled with Paul when he was on his missionary journeys. In fact, when you study through the book of Acts and we see these, these travels, we come across what we call the we passages. Not that they're little bitty, you know, the we little passages, but they're we passages because he goes from third person talking about Paul, he did this or they went there, and then all of a sudden he's talking second person. He says, we did this and this happened to us. And so he changes the, the grammar so we understand that whoever the writer is, he's with Paul at that particular time. Our first example of that is Acts chapter 16, verse 9 and 10. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So notice it begins with, in that passage, it's happening to Paul. It's about he and him. And then when they're getting ready to go, now it's we are going to go, and this is something for us. And so um, this is a point. It's in Troas. Um, therefore, people believe that Luke was probably from Troas, and that's where um, he met Paul and uh, was um, probably brought to Christ there. And as a result of that, Luke started to travel with him. And so uh, as, you, as you read through Acts, I'm going to encourage you to read through Luke at this point um, because we'll be looking at the Gospel of Luke. But if you read through Acts, you'll notice there's times when it's we did this and we were going there. And then all of a sudden it's they were doing it and he was doing it. So that means at that point, Luke and Paul weren't together for a little while. And then they'd be back together and, and we would have the passages where you know that Luke was with Paul. And so Luke, the doctor, the missionary, the writer, uh, uh, he, he is the one who um, gives us, who's the author of this book of Luke that we have. Let's meet someone else. Um, the second person I want to introduce you to is Theophilus. Now, how many of you know who Theophilus is? Any hands going up? Um, Theophilus is the recipient of this letter of, of Luke. Verse 3 says, um, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus. Now, this is the name I mentioned earlier about the ev some of the evidence that Luke wrote Luke, and he also wrote Acts, um, because this name only shows up twice in Scripture, and it shows up at the beginning of these two documents. Um, we saw the one in Luke um, in verse 3. Now we look at the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. So we find Theophilus receiving the book of Luke and we find Theophilus receiving the continuation of the book of Luke, which we call the book of Acts. Um, you know, again, so we see the continuation of Luke and Acts. Now, this name, Theophilus, as I mentioned, is only found twice in the Bible, and it literally means loved by God or carries the idea of friend of God. But we don't know who Theophilus is. There's no other information about him. Some, because of the name of Theophilus, that some have decided over time that Theophilus was just a generic title that applied to all Christians, you know, all of you who are loved by God, all of you who are friends of God. But when you look at the context of Luke and Acts, it looks like he's a real person that Luke is writing to an individual that knew um, something about the Christian faith and maybe Luke was witnessing to him, and then he received these documents, these manuscripts, to help him learn more about what he was saying, that it was true. And he addresses him as most excellent Theophilus. So of all the guesses out there, and there are several guesses of who he might be if he's a person, some say that he might have been some wealthy and influential man. 
Others think that he might be a Jewish high priest. And then others think that he was a lawyer that helped Paul in, one of those, in some of those trials. Again, those are guesses. We do not know. He's just mentioned twice, and that's all we know about him. But we do know what Luke's intentions were. He stated that so that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. We find in Luke chapter 1, Luke, Luke wrote a historical account of the life and death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he detailed the spread of Christianity uh, through the Roman Empire in the book of Acts. And his intention through all of that was to give Theophilus that certainty that the things that he had been taught, they were indeed true and they were trustworthy. So in a strange sort of way, you and I, you and I are a little bit like Theophilus, loved by God as we follow God. We are friends of God, the Bible shows us. And, and we have received these two manuscripts in our lives through the Bible today the book of Luke and the book of Acts to show us the life of Jesus and also um, the events of the, of the beginning of the church. So that's another person that, again, we don't hear much about, but it's in the book of Luke. Now let's meet a couple that we probably already know, Zacharias and Elizabeth. Um, now, this couple you're probably familiar with from the Christmas story, and we're introduced to them in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years." Now, depending on your translation, you will either find him as Zacharias or Zachariah. I guess I've been, most of my life, heard it Zacharias, so that's usually, what I, that's usually how I call him, even though the scripture I read from in the New American Standard has Zacharias. Um, they are described as righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly. Now, that's quite a description. How would you like, I mean, we had hoped that people would describe us today as we follow God as righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly. And that's how they were described. But, they, but we also hear some bad news about Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were old and they never had any children. Now, by being childless, there could be some assumptions made by people within their community. Remember, they're part of the Old Covenant. And part of the Old Covenant was, if you follow God and obey God, then God will bless you. Some of those blessings were children, okay? And, and, and in that day, in the day of Jesus, uh, the, it was pretty much, if you were religious, if you were following God as a Jew, and you were blessed in this life, if you, you, if you had things, if you had some money, and you had blessings, you had children, and all, all these things, then most people would look at you and make the assumption there's a righteous person. They're following God, and look, look how God has blessed them. But if you are in that community and were a follower of God, but did not receive those blessings, if you were struggling financially and you were struggling with your family and may not have a family, then the people of that community could talk amongst themselves and make the assumptions, well, they must not be following God very well, otherwise God would bless them. So Zechariah and Elizabeth were called righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly, but there was that cloud over their lives of being old and being childless, not having, not having the opportunity to bear children. Now, Luke quickly points out this assumption is not the case. They were not being uh, they were not being punished by God by not having a child. They were just going to get a delayed blessing from God. Instead of the blessing earlier in their life, they're going to get this blessing later on and then obviously um, be a part of something even greater. So really with all of this, Zechariah and Elizabeth are now put in the company of Abraham and Sarah or Isaac and Rebekah, who could not have children until God intervened. And in fact, 
God did intervene. He sent an angel to Zechariah to tell him that his wife would have a child. Luke chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. So Zechariah was the priest, and it was a prayer time. Uh, they had these daily prayer times. And what would happen is a priest would be picked kind of like by random, by, by uh, a drawing, okay? And you never knew when you would have the opportunity as a priest to do this. They'd draw your name, and then if, if your name was drawn, you were the priest that went into the temple area, and you would, you would burn the incense, and the smoke of that incense would go up um, into the sky, and all the people were out there during that prayer time, and they were praying, and you would be in that that particular prayer time in, in the temple area outside of the Holy of Holies, uh, but in the holy place, you would be, uh, as, a, as a priest, you would um, be praying as well. So you're praying, burning the incense, all the people around you are praying as well. And that's when the angel Gabriel spoke to Zechariah. And he says to him, your petition has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son. And then goes on to say, you and many more will rejoice at his birth. Now, because the angel spoke to Zechariah and said, your petition has been heard, we've kind of assumed that Zechariah was there praying that they would have a child. But I don't think he was praying that they would have a child. As I mentioned, as a priest, he might have one opportunity his entire life to be able to do this thing, to be able to go into the holy place, burn the incense during the time of prayer because there were many priests out there and you didn't know if you'd have your name um, um, chosen to do that ministry. And so I, I highly doubt that Zechariah was taking his once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to go in there as a representative of all the people of Israel and to pray about his own personal needs of having a child. I don't, I don't particularly think that's what he was praying for. I don't know, but that's not what I think. I believe Zechariah would have been praying for Israel that he would have been a representative of Israel. And as, a, as one praying for Israel, for the nation of Israel, the one prayer I could see him praying is the prayer for the Messiah. You see, the people were waiting for the Messiah. They were ready for the Messiah. And so for the, um, uh, so I'm sure all those times when they were praying, they kept, you know, that prayer would keep coming. Lord, are you ready to send your Messiah? And John, the, the child of Zechariah and Elizabeth, he was part of that plan of bringing the Messiah. So when the angel said, your prayer has been heard, your, your wife Elizabeth's going to have a child, I believe that prayer, that petition, would have been for the coming of the Messiah, and then the one would come before that, uh, which would be part of the answer to that prayer, would be the birth of John. So righteous Zechariah and Elizabeth were blessed with a baby in their old age, just like Abraham and Sarah. And that brings me to one more person introduced in this chapter, and that's John. We call him John the Baptist. And again, John is kind of skipped over. He's skipped over in the Christmas story because the focus is on Jesus and Mary and Joseph, right? Um, and then he's a little bit skipped over in the life of Jesus because he just has this, this part at the very beginning in the ministry of Jesus. And we read a little bit about John and then he's gone and the focus is on Jesus. So John doesn't have a, a lot of focus um, in, in his ministry, but he had a very vital part of this, this preparation for the people um, to follow God. Uh, and so in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, I wrote verse 14 in your notes, um, scratch that, put verse 17. In Luke chapter 1, verse 17, this is the job for John. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah 
to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. We call John the forerunner. He was the one who came before the Messiah. He was the one like a prophet who came and preached repentance to get the people to have their hearts right so that when the Messiah came, they would be prepared to accept and believe the Messiah and to follow the Messiah. He was part of God's plan so that the people of Israel would embrace the Messiah and follow him. Not everyone did because even John in um, his ministry, there were many doubters about what he was doing. And obviously, uh, there were many that doubted when Jesus came as well. But he was the one who was to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So John had a job before he was born and a very important job. And part of that, so that whole prayer and all that was, was part of um, this preparation for the people to receive the Messiah, the Savior, the Christ. So in this Christmas season, as we think about these people, I hope that you can be a little bit like Luke and serve the Lord, stating very clearly the message of Jesus. And I hope that you can be a little bit like Theophilus, loved by God, a friend of God, who've received this message. And I hope that you can be a little bit like Zechariah and Elizabeth, that you're called righteous in the sight of God, living a blameless life. And then I hope that you'd be a little bit like John as well, telling others, preparing their hearts so that they can believe in the Messiah, the Savior, who's Jesus. So as we look at these people, we can see that God had a job for them, had a use for them in the big picture of bringing Jesus into this world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, this message of the involvement of these people, people that we may not think about real often, but they were, they were used by you for your glory. Help us to be a people who are used by you for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. As we have our invitation song, if there's a decision that you need to make for Christ, we want to give you that opportunity. If you have a prayer request, I'll be glad to pray with you. Let's go ahead and stand together as we sing.